moment, and the treatments are only really symptomatic. So the, the overarching theme of my work is really working towards finding um, a drug that will alter the disease course or slow the disease progression. The predominant amount of Parkinson's patients, uh, we don't know why they get the disease. So it's of no known cause. Um, but there are some groups of patients where there's an identified gene causing Parkinson's. And I'm going to concentrate on some of these groups of patients to explain to you how the mitochondria are involved in Parkinson's. I'm going to talk a lot about Parkin gene and about the LARC2 gene. But first of all, the whole lecture is about mitochondria. So what are they? Mitochondria sit in every single cell of our body and I've drawn them here on this cartoon looking in this oval shape. Uh, and what they are is they're the batteries of the cell. They generate most of the cell's energy. They do lots of other things but their main function is to generate the cell's energy. And not only do they generate the energy but they actually move around the cell so to different parts of the cell that might be needing more energy at that time. So they will move to the part of the cell that needs the most energy. They can change their shape to make energy more efficiently. So if all of a sudden the cell needs to make more energy, because there's been an extra demand put on it, they can change their shape so they're more efficient at making energy. And just like us, they can use different types of food to make the energy. So you can give them different sugars to make the energy. So the first... Um, hint that micro mitochondria might be involved in Parkinson's actually came in the um, 1980s from California and it's when a group of heroin users uh, presented with a Parkinsonian-like syndrome and it was found that there was actually a contaminant in their heroin which stopped the mitochondria from working properly and this was um, causing the Parkinsonian-like symptoms in them. So after that, there was an explosion in research, people looking at mitochondria in Parkinson's. And they started off by looking in people with Parkinson's, and they looked in the brain, so in post-mortem brain samples, and in the skin cells. I'm going to talk quite a lot about research on skin cells tonight. Also in the <coughs> muscle and in the blood. And in all of these tissues, um, they found that the mitochondria were not working properly. So not just in where you might expect the brain cells, which are obviously affected in Parkinson's, but also in lots of other peripheral tissues of the body, the mitochondria were not working properly. And since then, people have also looked in a whole different group of animal models. So they've manipulated the genes that we should know are involved in Parkinson's, and all those animal models, whether they be the fly, the mouse or the rat, or the zebrafish, most of them have shown problems with the mitochondria. So really, there's a huge evidence built up that the mitochondria are not working properly in Parkinson's. I'm just going to go through some of that in more detail now. So I said I'd talk a bit about Parkin. So Parkin, mutations in this gene are the most common cause of early onset Parkinson's. And the gene um, causes this by losing its normal function. So it doesn't work properly. And actually, it's now been linked to playing a role in getting rid of mitochondria from the cell that are not working properly. So now we can see that if Parkin doesn't work properly, then it can't rid the cell of the mitochondria that are not working properly. So what we did, and now what others have done as well, is we've taken skin cells from the forearm of patients with Parkinson's due to changes in this Parkin gene and have looked at the activity, the function of the mitochondria. And so this graph on the left shows a reading of just overall function of the mitochondria. And the blue bar is skin cells from controls and the red bar is skin cells from people with Parkinson's due to the Parkin mutation. So I hope you can all see there's quite a big reduction in overall mitochondrial function. And then what this shows on the right is actually, does that reduction in the mitochondria functioning, does that reduce the amount of energy that they're producing for the cell? So this measures total energy in the cell. And again, there's a reduction in the skin cells from patients with Parkinson's. So I said at the beginning in the introduction that the mitochondria can change shape. And I'd drawn them as an oval in the cartoon. Well, actually, in skin cells, 
they don't really look very oval like so here is one skin cell from a control and one skin cell from someone with Parkinson's because of a Parkin mutation and so hopefully you can see that actually there's some discrete mitochondria here and then there's some which are all linked together and what we found is that in the skin cells from patients with Parkin mutations, the mitochondria were more linked together. So essentially, I can take one mitochondria here and I can trace it for quite a long way before it loses its connection to the rest of the mitochondrial network. And what we found was this change in shape actually links with the change in function. So I also said I'd talk about a different gene, LARC2. And LARC2 is the most common known genetic cause of Parkinson's. And it causes not early onset disease, but late onset disease that is more similar to the sporadic disease that most patients get. And importantly, not everyone that has mutations in LARC2 actually gets Parkinson's. Or if they do, they get it at various ages. So there may be a group of people there that have a mutation and haven't yet developed Parkinson's. If we're thinking about going forward for treatment. LARC2 itself is a huge protein and we don't really know yet what it does. But we've looked in um, skin cells from patients with LARC2 mutations and also in skin cells from people that have the mutation but they don't have any symptoms of Parkinson's. And what we've found when we looked at the um, shape is that the people with the mutation and Parkinson's symptoms have a really interconnected mitochondrial network, whereas the people with the mutations without symptoms don't. So this graph just shows you a quantification of that, the branching. So here are the controls, and the red bar on the end are the people with the mutation and with Parkinson's symptoms. And they've got a more interconnected network. And in the middle here are the people with the mutation that don't have Parkinson's symptoms. The function in these group of patients is also reduced. So very, very similar to the function that we saw with the Parkin mutation uh, patients. Um, and the, the group here that have the mutation but don't have um, Parkinson's symptoms um, sit somewhere in the middle, again, when you're looking at the functional mitochondrial readouts. So what about the animal models of Parkinson's? So I said at the beginning that um, mitochondrial changes have been found in mice, rats, flies, zebrafish that have been used to model the, the, uh, the disease. Specifically, when you're looking at, at um, Parkin, Parkin has been, uh, as Parkin's function has been reduced in fly models, in zebrafish, and in mouse models. And in all of those, the mitochondria don't function correctly. But also, not just in Parkin animal models, but in animal models linked to other gene mutations that cause Parkinson's, so PINK1, alpha-synuclein, and LARC2, the most common genetic cause. In the animal models, mitochondrial problems have also been found. Another animal model which shows that mitochondria have a role to play in Parkinson's is the so-called toxin exposure model. And this is where um, rats or mice are expo exposed to a toxin, so a pesticide, over a period of weeks and subsequently they develop um, Parkinson's-like symptoms and those mice have mitochondrial dysfunction as well. So what about mitochondria in the biggest group of patients, the sporadic group of patients? So I said people have looked in post-mortem brain tissue and they've shown a reduction in mitochondrial function. People have looked in blood cells and shown a reduction in mitochondrial function. And people have looked in skin cells and shown a reduction in mitochondrial function. But when thinking about this, the largest group of patients, it's really important to note that patients with sporadic Parkinson's get Parkinson's for different reasons, most of which we have no idea at the moment. So the data is much more variable when we take that large group of patients than if we look at one genetic cause. 
Then the data, we get a bigger difference and it's much less variable than if we look in the bigger sporadic group of patients. My research focuses on understanding how mitochondrial dysfunction affects the survival of brain cells in Parkinson's and then ultimately how we might then be able to use this information to find new drugs and treatments to help people that are affected by Parkinson's. They are finding a lot of success with this approach and they think they're identifying people much earlier who are in the very early stages of Parkinson's. So hopefully we're getting closer to predicting.